My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. You can also find links to previous conversations there. Um, my guest today is John Gringo. John specializes in photographic education through online training, books, and international photo tours. He's an energetic and enthusiastic presenter known for his visual teaching style, and his photographic teaching has been viewed by millions around the globe and have proven to be popular and effective. So please welcome John Gringo. Hey, John, can we get this officially started now? I'm all ready with my clapper here. You guys ready? Go for it. Take one. Now it's on. This has to be a one take for folks. Now we can start. We've known each other for a while here in Seattle. Uh, you worked for Art Wolf for, for quite a while. You did the Travels to the Edge. And we did a lot of stuff together at Creative Live. Um, so how did you get started in this whole photography thing? It was uh, pretty simple. I was in college and I needed some art credits and photography seemed like the most enjoyable way to deal with the art world, which I wasn't much into at the time, but I took to it like a fish to water, I guess, is something I immediately fell in love with. So I took all the photography classes I could at that school and then I transferred to a larger university where I continued and ended up getting my degree in photography. So how did you hook up with Art Wolf? Um, that was a real uh, bit of luck. The, uh, the strange story is, is that I was going to one of his large shows. I think it was at the Seattle Opera House. He was doing one of his big slideshow talks. And at the time I had just gone to Iceland and my buddy and I had shot a documentary of our journey, and we were wanting to put together a slideshow. We were trying to figure out, well, how did he do his slideshow? Well, let's go up in the balcony after the, the show and look at what projectors he's using and what type of lenses and how does this dissolve system work? Because he was using a three projector, old, you know, old school dissolve system. And I just was, you know, we, we hung around till we were the last people in the uh, allowed there. And he's like, well, what are you guys doing here? And started talking about things. He goes, well, I'm going to Iceland next year. I'd really like to see what you've shot there. And so he invited me over to his house and I did my whole show, which is about a 45 minute uh, little documentary of our bicycle trip around Iceland. And he gave me dinner and we watched the show and talked about Iceland. And then we kind of became friends and, um, uh, Kind of one of the, the things to do if you can get the invite is Art would have a photographer's Christmas party every year. And everybody would bring six images and we'd have this huge, amazing slideshow of all his friends that are professional photographers that travel the world. And you'd have this just amazing collection for three hours of people's travels and stories from around the world. Yeah, Michael. Um, John, um, how did you assist uh, um, Art? Well, uh, so that's how I got to know Art. And then when he started doing Travels to the Edge, he needed a small crew to go out with him. Right. And he kind of had his A camera shooter and he had his B camera shooter and he needed somebody else to help out with everything, which can be carrying gear, right. handling money, working with passports. And so I wasn't um, a personal assistant, but I was kind of an assistant to everyone, but I was mainly making sure that everything worked right for Art. Um, Art's a fantastic photographer, but sometimes in the technical minded, get into the menu and reprogram this aspect of the camera, he's not the most fluid at that. Um, and so I was very technical in that regard. So I kind of compensated for that area. Were you working for him when all of his equipment was stolen in the in the trunk of his car? No, that was uh, prior to me. That was in San Francisco. And you know, I've, I've heard that story a dozen times where okay. he was devastated. It, it's still sad to see that there's a lot of thefts still going on in San Francisco with photographers. And that really hasn't changed in 25 years. It, it, um, and the reason why I asked that is that um, I was headed to work at Canon and on 1010 Winds, which is the, the, the big news station, 
a radio news station out here, I heard that um, uh, uh, internationally known photographer Art Wolf uh, was eating in a, uh, in a diner. Um, and when he got back at, uh, to his car, all of his trunk was open and all of his equipment and all of the film that he had just gotten done shooting was stolen. I got on the phone because I, I knew Art. Uh, I got on the phone and I called him up and I said, can I do anything for you? Anything. <laughs> All right. Knowing that, you know, he was shooting Nikon at the time. And he said, that's very nice of you. I'll, I'll call you. About three days later, four days later, I get a call from Art. He said, you're the only one in the entire photographic industry that called me up offering me help. I said, what do you need? And he gave me a list of stuff and I sent it to him. And he's still shooting Canon equipment. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that was um, that was a very big moment for him. And for any of you who don't know, the other part of the story is that he was out shooting for four weeks in the Southwest, all through Utah, Arizona, all the national parks. And I think we all can imagine, how would you feel if you had the last four weeks of your life just gone in an instant? Yeah, and all that film. I mean, in those days, it was film. So he must, in knowing heart, he must have you know, shot like uh, four, maybe five bricks of film. Yeah. Or gone. Yeah, well, let's go on to talk about John now. Uh, I mean, I know you for also for your travel work, and COVID's really cut that down. Uh, so how, how's the past year been for you? Are you planning new travel? Uh, what's going on there? Well, yeah, I had gone to Bhutan and I had, I actually had a tour planned in Kenya that I had to cancel because of COVID. And so that shut down all my travels completely. And I just tried to make the best use of the time as I could. I've been going through a lot of changes. I got married, I've moved houses. Um, and I'm starting kind of this whole new enterprise of doing classes on my own now. And so the last year and a half has been slowly building up all these different elements. I wanted to be able to have a studio in the house that meant a new house. So of course, looking, moving, getting all that set up. Um, and then even just getting the studio that I'm at right now took months of piecing it together because there's not a lot of great, um, step-by-step -step instructions of you need to do exactly this and this and this because everyone has a different requirement in their studio. They have a different space, they have different needs. And so every studio is gonna be customized according to the, to the needs. And then having to get and sell all my classes online, there's just a lot of web development and design work and everything else. And so uh, I was gonna be stuck at home anyway. So <laughs> COVID hit at the right time in my life if it had to hit. Um, I got a lot of work done. Yeah, so you've started doing some new books too, or not books, but online instruction manuals for various cameras. What are the latest ones you have out? Well, I just uh, opened my new online shop at johngringo.com uh, just over a month ago. Today is a month and a day. And I uh, wanted to launch with a bevy of new cameras. And so we started with, let's see, the Fuji X-T4, the Olympus OM-D EM-1 Mark III. Then we added the Canon 90D, the Canon R5, which is incredibly popular. I cannot believe how many people have that camera and want that class. Um, we added the Sony a 7 and R4 and the Nikon D780. So I've got micro four thirds, crop frame, full frame, mirrorless, DSLR. So I got a little bit of something for everyone. And then I had to have one class that would be good for everyone. So I put out a brand new class called Composition Essentials, uh, which is uh, somewhat similar to some things that I've done before as part of the fundamentals, but more in a consolidated small package and updated so that it's got all the latest thoughts and photos and everything else to make it the best possible. So do the camera manufacturers supply a camera to you to do these or do you go out and buy each one? I go out and buy each one. I have you know more cameras around me than just about anyone I've ever met. And I've realized you have to be careful on what you wish for. <laughs> um, I've always liked cameras and like, oh, I, I have a Canon. I want a Nikon. I want to see what the Fuji's like. Um, 
I really, at this point, would just like to have one camera really customized and configured the way I want. Instead, I'm going back and forth between seven, eight different cameras. John, can I pipe like in here and just say that um, I actually forget what cameras we have in the house. <laughs> uh, John said the other day something about one of the cameras that we're, we're about to do a class on. And I won't say which one, John, don't worry. <laughs> and I said, you better go and buy that one because, you know, we're going to have to start filming that soon. And he said, I've already got it. I forget which cameras we have. He's got that many. <laughs> so, Michael. Um, John, I want to give you some advice. <laughs> this is always dangerous. Um, yeah. Um, the most pop, but, but you're not doing anything about the most popular camera system in the world, are you? No, I'm not. And I think I know where you're going. Yeah, I won't <laughs> say it, okay? But the other thing is, you know, you could call up any of the camera manufacturers and say that um, uh, you, do re you do reviews. And when you say you do reviews, you'll get more cameras and you know what to do with. The thing is, is that I don't do reviews. I do education on how the camera works. Same thing. And so I'm not trying to propose to people to buy a particular camera. Uh, my personal philosophy is they're all pretty darn awesome. Um, I'm showing how they work and translating the instruction manual from whatever pseudo English that that is into real world explanations with visuals and examples and advice on, well, I would use this feature for this and that one for that. And so people like Newler, that translation. Yeah, Newler, not for nothing, but John is in the unique position of saying, nobody's given me anything. So I am under no obligation to say anything nice about anything. Mm -hmm. I've been painted with the Canon brush because um, Martin Evening and I both shot Canon and all of the images in one of our book were primarily Canon. So people said, well, he's a Canon shooter. He gets all that stuff for free. The very fact that John has the integrity to eat the or buy the dog food and eat it, it's a huge difference in terms of credibility. So congratulations on that. Um, uh, Michael Reichman, also another uh, camera equipment junkie and Kevin Raber, they both would accept cameras for review, but really only did kind of a, here's this new camera and this is what the camera company is saying about it. But the actual cameras that they reviewed were cameras that they bought and used. And that was what their reviews were. So there's, no, you don't want to get, but, uh, but, but you don't want to get touched. I get touched with, with yeah, let's, let's being an Epson over guy. The, the that my Michelle was going to show us a tour of the studio. See what John's doing here. Yeah, so we've got uh, we got the camera on a tripod here. We'll do a quick little 360 if you want to see. So I don't have a huge space. I, I will just let on for anyone who are fans. I do have bigger plans, but it's going to take probably two years for that to work out. And so we've got a small bedroom, and I designed. I needed it to fit at least me in a chair with <laughs> my big monitor. And so Michelle, you can go ahead and we'll go this direction. And so we have got one monitor that usually has all my class display and so forth on it. This is my prop stand. And so I made a prop stand. So I had something to focus on and key to it is I needed a human face and an animal face so that I can show how cameras are doing face detect and animal face detect and can track with the camera moving around a little bit. So it's a little bit limited in that regard. Wait, what, what, what's that thing in the upper right-hand corner? Uh, we got some uh, a, a roll of Coda, an unopened roll of Kodachrome 64. <laughs> Michelle's going to hold it closer to the camera. I don't know if it's in focus. It's unopened. It was sitting around. I don't know where I got it. I think I might have got it when I was working at Glazer's camera, and someone just gave me some old film when they I went digital. No, somebody else. It was oh. before that. And then I have some of the old Kodak canisters, the metal yeah, canisters. The same the same canisters, the yellow with the red top. And I've Michael, got an unopened box of 3M640T tungsten 
<laughs> film <laughs> sitting around here somewhere. Or All right, why so people ask me if I shoot film, so I take a picture of the film. The camera will adjust brightness <laughs> here. Uh, you can't really see it. There's a light stand. There's a camera. It's got a little drape over it. I don't know what's standard in studios, but uh, there's a little bit of dust in here. And so I decided to throw a little, um, it's a Mamiya lens cleaning cloth. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want, you know, in depth here, look. Uh, so I just throw that over some uh, black magic 4K cameras that we use for filming. So that's officially camera number two. Rotating further, we've get uh, to the main area where I have camera one and two monitors, one that shows me exactly what's going on in the uh, slideshow and another one that shows me behind the scenes notes. We've got another light stand. There's a light above it that you can't quite see. Uh, my wife, Michelle, made all the black drapes for the studio for sound and light purposes. We've got uh, camera three over in the corner there, which is getting the back shot of the camera. You can't see it, but there's a fourth camera straight above me so that you can see top down. Um, and then I have my little cameras that I sit out in front here and show what's going on. Cool. We've got a couple of questions coming into the chat from Kevin uh, saying your courses are awesome. He's got the new X-T4. And it's been really helpful. And he's watching the 24-hour camera course on Creative Live. And he asked if you plan a new version of this in your own studio. Um, it's going to be a little while before I can build up to that. I think he might be referring to my fundamentals of photography. Uh, last one was done in 2018. And so, uh, yeah, I'm kind of restarting the whole career, you might say. And I'm going to be growing a very large it's going to be an inverted pyramid, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm building the base right now. And so it'll be a little while before I, I go and, and do a redo of that. Yeah, John Hess is asking, what was the small tripod you used in your Fuji X-T4 class? Um, yeah, I have been using this really right stuff uh, tripod, which was really great. But just with the lineup in here, I needed a little bit more height. And so they make a new version, which has legs that come out to one, two or three positions. And it is the really right stuff. I, I forget the number, it's like the 01. If you go to really right stuff, look at their tabletop tripods, it'll be pretty obvious. I did stick a beefier head on it because I need to rotate the camera. And so I needed that pano ability without mm -hmm. loosening up the whole head. So talking about your classes here, I'm gonna share my screen and just show some of the samples of, uh, why is my screen not sharing the right window again? Zoom's acting up on me today, Adobe Bridge. Are you so seeing, John, yes. John, while you're working with that, let me just explain to anybody who doesn't know anything about my classes. Uh, yeah, I know there's a ton of people on YouTube who are telling you the top five settings on a camera. And usually they just take the camera and they say, well, let me just show you these five things. And there's like not really a lot of preparation. I spend weeks making the graphics for these classes. Each class has on average 15,000 elements that I am coordinating to make and explain things in as simple and as easy terms as possible. It sounds like it's really cluttered and everything moving all over the place. Now, it's, I try to make a very clean and elegant uh, explanation of how everything works and uh, giving people lots of tips on where they can customize their cameras and how things work best for different types of scenarios. And so the, the difference, I think, between my camera classes and anyone else's is immense preparation for a very smooth final class. I go through the entire menu, every item in there, which does make it for a longer class, but it's very complete in that regard. Lots of examples before and after how different things work. So have you also done an R6 or just the R5? Well, uh, I was not even going to be doing the R5 for the original introduction of five classes, but it became so popular, I had time to do one. And so I decided to kind of rush the R5 out. Not that the class took any shortcuts at all, but I decided to get that one out. And uh, I will officially make an announcement, John, that I haven't made anywhere else. And that is, is that the R6 class will be available in August. I believe the first Friday, I forget what day that is off right now. 
And the other camera is the Nikon Z7 and Z62. So those two classes will be available at the beginning of August. And I do know that I haven't done camera classes for a while and I have a lot of cameras to catch up on. And so it's a bit of a balance of these new cameras that are coming out like the Nikon, or excuse me, yeah, the Nikon ZFC, that looks kind of interesting versus some other models that I might've missed over the last year or so. And John, I don't and think we, you've mentioned um, anywhere yet which camera classes you're doing next. So that's a scoop for you, Cornicello. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So you also have a new blog going. I think you, the latest thing is about safety for photographers. Yeah, risk and the travel photographer wanted to talk a little bit about that extra risk photographers have uh, thinking about camera equipment getting stolen, broken, et cetera, and then also dealing with COVID. And how this, it's been a month now that you've got the new site up, right? Yes. We should put a link to that in the chat, Michelle. Can you do that? So one thing that people might not know about John. Sorry, I said probably... yes, but I had it on mute. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll do that. Okay, great. Uh, John was in, actually one of the inventors of the selfie stick. <laughs> I apologize to everyone for that. Actually, it was a monopod with his camera on it <laughs> on that, that fateful trip. <laughs> yeah, that was the, uh, the ice axe monopod. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very cool. Do people in the audience have some questions for John? Michael, of course, but let's go to Gail Meyer. So, John, I, um, I'm curious what you think the future is going to be for the digital cameras and their, and their features. So, so autobiographically, I'm a Nikon shooter, invested in Nikon. And, you know, I wish we weren't all heavily invested in one brand or another so that we could go and use the features of the other brand when it's better. But I guess you could become extremely rich if you'll come up with the lens that we has the Canon Nikon Sony switch on it. Um, but um, what do you think the what do you think the future is of the desirable features as these companies come out with cameras? Um, well, I'm kind of interested in where computational photography is going to take us because uh, for those of you not familiar. Lens designers want to design the best quality lens, and then the people marketing want to make the smallest, lightest weight, easiest to manufacture a lens. And there's certain shortcuts you can take in making a lens, and you can digitally compensate for it. You know, you can have a lens that has a lot of distortion, and then when you stick it on the appropriate body that knows about it, it fixes the distortion. But if you were to adapt that lens to another system, you're going to see all the distortion. Um, maybe the clearest case is uh, for a long time I had a little Sony, one of the 60, 6, 000, A6000 with a little kit lens. And when you turn the camera on for about a half second, you could see all this massive distortion and then it fixed it all as soon as it turned it on. And so a little bit of my love fear is manufacturers making smaller, lighter weight lenses that they just digitally compensate for with you know, flare issues and chromatic aberration and sharpness in the corners and so forth. And we're seeing more and more of this. And so I, I don't know exactly where it's going. I'm a little concerned because I like a lens just to be good from the beginning so that you could adapt it and use it on, on different things. But clearly, uh, intelligent focus is a big thing. That's the term that I call it, but face tracking, animal tracking. And we're going to see it probably move into learning within the particular camera. So let's just say you like to focus on trains. It's gonna start learning trains and what understanding trains look like. Are they coming at you going away? Is that the front of the train or the back of the train? Um, and so cameras that are learning and that whole processing power um, is gonna change. Now, how much that changes for us as photographers? I'm not really sure. Jeff, she was asking about light field cameras or the multi-lens. Yeah, that was a really interesting concept that seemed to get passed by very quickly. I mean, it came out for a while, being able to take a photo 
where, and this was always a dream of mine, uh, especially when I wasn't as skilled as I was now, can I refocus in Lightroom? Where's the, the, the focus slider so that I can move the focus forward and back and then expand it and, and bring it back in? Um, and I could see how that would come around again. I guess, you know, if I can give away, if there's some secret manufacturer who's watching in here, the, you know, my idea of a great camera, if I was gonna start from scratch, I would start with a circular sensor and it would be curved so that you can make lenses a little bit smaller. I think that this whole concept is a terrible idea on cameras. I think we should have a circle and you can decide a panoramic format within there, or you could have a vertical and you would just have a button here you press for four by five vertical or two by three horizontal and rotate through your cycle of favorite aspect ratios. And I don't like looking and see what shutter speed, uh, it's 500th of a second. Um, not that I actually do that, but I love the Fuji and who is it? I think Canon has also changed to vertical displays when you look through the camera vertically. I think a camera should be held in one manner. Um, I, I do like the concept of, of um, well, I used to love shooting Hasselblad because I would get a square and I could go either vertical or horizontal without worrying about what the fuck the aspect ratio was, because that's one of the things that bugged me about, um, you know, the four thirds or the three, two formats. I used to shoot eight by 10, but, you know, being able to use the aspect ratio of the crop that is right for the image, as opposed to falling in love with some sort of artificial format. Well, I happen to know one of the guys at Adobe, one of the uh, engineers, Todor Goryev, who is a Russian, who has been working on this bug eye lens concept, which is like everything from wide to telephoto with multiple sensors for uh, high dynamic range. It's just, it's, at this point, it's all science fiction, but the light field camera was short lived, but it was interesting because it did kind of give rise to what is happening with the multi-lens camera on the, uh, in particular, the iPhone uh, 12. Um, and you haven't talked about um, uh, um, camera phones, it's the camera that everybody has with them. It's, you know, ever present. Uh, and you, I've gotten some great shots with the, with my iPhone that um, I've gotten over the embarrassment of showing images shot with an iPhone just because it was an iPhone. So you don't have any iPhone tutorials, although a lot of your general concepts could be adopted to iPhones pretty easily. But being able to refocus and change the bokeh is part of the whole computational aspect. Being able to change um, the aspect ratio and also being able to change the focal length uh, photographically, I think that would be pretty cool. Go ahead. Yeah, the iPhone, that's always been an interesting discussion with John. <laughs> yeah. and. I'll, I'll state it for anyone who hasn't seen it. You know, I haven't done an iPhone class, partly because um, the average person who owns an iPhone, not some of you more serious photographers who just happen to also use the iPhone, for most of the people who own the iPhone or whatever device as their primary picture taking tool, they're not going to buy a photography class. It's just not important enough to them. Um, I think it is kind of interesting that my best-selling classes are for cameras that are $3,000. It's people who are invested into the craft of photography that end up getting those types of cameras that end up getting the classes. It's, it's possible I could do a class for an iPhone. I'm not going to rule it out. So never say never. That's, that's kind of big news. Thinking back four or five years ago uh, on our trips to Cuba, you wouldn't even think about an iPhone. <laughs> I use the iPhone all the time for taking photos, all the time. I have photos of the pipes that I need replacing in my house. <laughs> I need a photo of what the flower looked like in the garden in the month of May, just so that I can see what it looks like in the month of June. And so I use it for all sorts of very practical purposes like that. I mean, that's what I use mine for too. So we're, we're in the same, same page there. Michael, go ahead. Cover you up. 
So what would happen if Nikon, Canon, Sony, all the all, all of them decided that the that the 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 internal aperture onto the sensor and the sensor itself was 36 by 36 instead of 24 by 36. I think that could work out because I think lens, I mean, it's an old Stephen Wright one-liner joke. If you remember, it's, you know, round lenses, square pictures. What am I losing here? You know, what's going on? Um, we're projecting a circular image into the, the camera. So you could use a 36 by 36 and that that could be a big revolutionary, very easy step to go with. Well, that's what I proposed a long time ago. And, and, and when I proposed it, um, the folks at the camera company C looked at me like I was coming from the planet Uranus. <laughs> um, and yet their, their mantra was they wanted, to, they wanted to stomp on medium format cameras. Well, medium format cameras are basically square. A lot of them. So, so turn your rectangular format camera into a into a square. Yeah, I think thirty five millimeter. It um, it would have made things a little bit tough back in the film era with the shutter speed because you'd have a little bit further travel to go. Right. But I think as we move towards the world of global shutters and no physical shutter in the camera, that would be far more doable. So. So the question is, and let me come back to the fir my first question, is why do you avoid um, um, any of the smartphones? I, I guess I, I like catering to people who really are into photography and those people buy cameras. Now they also use their phones, as I say. Um, and I don't know that there's really much that limits um, you know, if you know how to work your Canon 5D Mark IV or Nikon Z7 or whatever, you're going to probably know how to work your, your camera, your, your phone quite easily. Okay. Because there's, there's a limited number of features that are in there. And I suppose I could do a half hour class on, you know, special features in your phone. However, in your class, the way it's, the way it's presented now, besides teaching the different uh, parts of a camera and what they do. Do you go beyond that? In other words, uh, what that tool does to be able to get you the image that you're ultimately looking to make. Do you teach I would composition? say, yeah. Do you, do you, so you teach composition? Not in my camera classes. And uh, so, Okay, so yeah, I, I do have to separate out. One of the first things I say in my camera classes is we're focusing on this camera, not general photography or lighting and composition. Those are all really important, but those are separate classes. So all you've done, you've taken a general course that we used to call, let's say, Nikon school, all right? And you segmented it into different sections of cameras, lenses, filters, Flash composition. Um, not exactly, but I think you're you're generally looking in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned electronic shutters there, and for us who work in the studio and sync with flash, right now the, I don't think any camera syncs flash with their electronic shutter. Is that something you see changing, or do you know anything about that? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I. It might be the R5. For, pardon me, but I speak yes. 12 different languages fluently <laughs> when it comes to cameras. But when you ask me on the spot, what is this do or that one, I get mixed up. But there's one of the cameras that actually syncs faster when you use the electronic first shutter curtain than when you use the full mechanical. And so the Sony A9 and the A9 Mark II are, is one of the most remarkable cameras on the market as far as the shutter, because it's it's gotten away from this rolling shutter that we've gotten. It still exists, but the scan rate from the bottom of the frame to the top of the frame is so quick that you basically don't notice it with things that are moving back and forth. And so they're, they're getting close and we're probably still five years away from getting a camera without a physical shutter in there. But 
the, the potential, if we can get all those pixels to turn on and off at the right time, how would you like, uh, say, a flash sync of two thousandth of a second? I mean, it's, it's, does, it usually doesn't matter to me. I mean, I don't use high speed sync or anything like that either. So I don't think about it in those terms. But, but it's just on most cameras, if you turn on the silent shutter, it turns off the hot shoe or the contacts for the, for the flash. Yeah, yeah. Right now, for most people, I'm still recommending using either the mechanical shutter or in many cameras like the Sony's and the new R5 and R6, the electronic first first shutter. First shutter. Those are mm -hmm. kind of becoming the standard. But even using the electronic first curtain shutter, that's a step in that direction. Yeah. Is the, I believe is that's, the, what I'm, that's what I'm doing with the Canon R5, I believe. Thanks, Steve. Is the trigger circuit uh, still a problem or becoming more of a problem with the newer cameras? You mean camera? the, the voltage? Yeah. No, I think most cameras have knocked it down to five volts or less so that they're, you don't damage the, the shutter in the camera. I mean, about 10 years ago, you know, Canon was a 250 volt, um, a lot of strobes. So you, you would hit the contacts in the um, shutter release. But I think most strobes now are down to five volts or less. Do you have anything there, John? No, that's uh, an area where I think you're a, a much better expert than I am. So I remember they used to buy the safe sink from wine to go in the hot shoe to, to cut the voltage down. Remember those? Still got them around here somewhere. Well, it's amazing the, the, the things the, I've got around here somewhere. The real <laughs> issue is, and to get the, 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 uh, the workaround was to put a little tiny uh, uh, blink flash in the hot shoe and point it up at the ceiling. And when that went off, it would fire the eye in, let's say, a 2400 watt uh, uh, a speedotron pack or, or a Belcar pack that was that had a trigger circuit voltage um, that was too high for the electronic uh, cameras, or the new electronic cameras. That, that yeah, that was... worked until people started using flashes that use ETTL that put out two flashes. So the first flash That's would right. fire the strobe. And you That's don't right. get any exposure, but right. but anyway, let's let's move on. I want to go back to talking about travel and some of your favorite places to go, John. Even though we can't right now. <laughs> yeah, certainly. No, I've uh, had the fortune to travel to a lot of different places, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting back out there. That's for sure. What we what are some of your favorite places to travel to, and we'll to take workshops to actually. Well, John, the one that, that we have in common is Cuba. And in trying to explain Cuba to people who haven't been there, uh, one thing that I think is just absolutely true is that I've been to about 50 countries and the Cuban people are the friendliest to Americans of any country I've been to. Um, it is just so easy walking the streets, picking up conversations with people. A lot of them speak English there even though Spanish is obviously their native language there. And so I, I've had a lot of wonderful travel experiences in a lot of great countries, but I've never met people so friendly to Americans. And I think it, it has to do with the fact of the adversarial governments that have been back and forth. And they know that if you've taken the time and effort to go to Cuba, it's a little bit more than, than most people would do. And so uh, they really appreciate- yeah, I'm showing some pictures of us in Cuba. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Got the tilt shift lens out. <laughs> Yeah, and so I've had a great time. I've done about four or five. Yeah, I've done five tours of Cuba um, and look forward to go back at some point as well. Are they, still you get to are they still educational? Yes. And now they, uh, these are, in the industry, we've got workshops and we've got tours. And my personal definition is in, when you're on a tour, the primary focus is seeing the land and the people of where you're at. And we're not going to spend an inordinate amount of time in a darkened room reviewing images, talking about composition. We will take some time to review images and talk about how you are doing and what can be done to improve that. So we'll usually do two review sessions over the course of a week. But we're not, it, we're not going to school while we're in Cuba. We're taking advantage of being in that environment. Uh, workshops, I think, are much more uh, educational based and a lot more in the classroom based and hands-on and shooting. 
Um, and so we try to learn as much as we can on the go, but it's more about experiencing, seeing, and uh, as, you, as you're there. Mm -hmm. Steve is saying he's got a trip planned to Antarctica later this year, and he's wondering what your top one or two best tips, tips would be for that experience. So Antarctica, I've been to twice, and you know, there's two different types of shooting. There's shooting from the boat and then getting on the land. And so when you're on the boat, that's where that 100 to 400 type lens is going to be very handy and a very warm jacket so that you can sit out there waiting for the icebergs and the clouds and things to line up in the correct way. And so uh, I spent a lot of time out on the front of the boats just kind of waiting for things to line up. Uh, you're limited in how close you can get because uh, you're you know on a boat. But then when you get on land, um, you, it depends on the boat. I've taken a couple of trips down there and one of them had a very uh, I'm lenient cruise director that was, okay, we're gonna be here for four hours. So we'll see you back for lunchtime. And in other cases, they're like, okay, we're gonna have 30 minutes, stay with, within the ropes and don't go beyond the blue border line. And you're very, very restricted. And so it really depends on what the setup is on that. But uh, get, uh, get yourself prepared for as much land time as possible. You don't want to be the last person off the boat because you had breakfast late. And oh, what's an hour on land? It's not that big a deal. Each landing, each hour, each minute on land is precious. And so take the most advantage of it that you can. You know, Jeff and Stephen have been to Antarctica a few times too. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, well, one of the things that I'd say is to make sure you got backups. We had one shore landing that was in the rain and mist, and about a dozen people had either lens or camera failures because of moisture. I mean, it's just, uh, um, and um, it really pissed me off because. Uh, um, I had one lens that had moisture on the inside and I never could get rid of it. Um, the other thing that I'd say is to make sure that you don't go on a trip to Antarctica with a new camera. Make sure you know exactly how to use your camera. Be very accurate. Buy one of John's tutorials for your camera uh, and bring the manual because uh, although I, uh, I carry the manual in uh, PDF form, but uh, if there's a question on a function, you got to be able to look it up. Uh, and then the other thing is just uh, have a whole shitload of cards because you will shoot a lot. And the one of the worst things that could happen is to run out of pixels. You know, so I I took twice as many cards as I would have expected to. Um, you have downtime, and that's when you're downloading uh, off of the cards. But uh, you, you literally, uh, I, I remember one time we had a couple of people that didn't bring enough cards, and they had to run back to their room to download a card uh, just so that they could keep shooting. And then they came back, and we all, of course, made fun of them. Oh, you should have seen it. We had <laughs> dancing girls and a whale that um, uh, did, you know, jumps and backflips and they were like, really? And it's like, no, of course not. But that would be the thing. Know your camera really well and have a whole shitload of cards. I want, I want to say something about Jeff's uh, story about the damaged cameras from moisture. Uh, that was landing uh, basically in the rain. We told everybody if they didn't have any sort of camera protection, go to the uh, kitchen and get some plastic garbage bags and they didn't do it these people that lost their cameras it was the first landing of a almost two week trip if I recall correctly and a number of cameras went down and uh, it wasn't Antarctica per se it was these people lack of common sense you don't go shooting in the rain without some sort of protection for your camera no matter how weatherized yeah, well, Jim, that would work, but anything, you know, a garbage <laughs> bag would have probably kept sure. these people photographing. And of course, some of them didn't have backup cameras. And so part of what allowed them to continue to photograph on the journey was other people's generosity of loaning their backup cameras to these people, which is, you know, a fairly standard level of generosity that you find on these trips. When we lead a trip, one of the things that we're trying to do is build community. 
And the community definitely showed after those people had their cameras go down. But Antarctica is um, not as severe as one would think during the summertime, unless you do have a bad storm. We used to joke with Jeff because being from Chicago, Chicago was actually, we were warmer than Chicago was when we were down there at times, <laughs> but it was summertime in Antarctica and wintertime in Chicago. So um, the, the thing that I would say more than anything else is be prepared for a landscape really unlike anything you've ever seen before, both in land made of ice, which it often is, even though rock is often showing through, it does feel like you're on the edge of another planet. And that's what makes it so um, absolutely seduction. You know, you get seduced by that landscape so quickly. Mm -hmm. And it means that you do have a lot of repetition of a lot of abstract ice, at least I did. But by the same token, uh, sorting those things out over the years, you find that there is a a kind of sensual design and otherworldly quality that is even beyond what you were able to fully take in and appreciate while you were there. You're going to have a great oh, thanks. Yeah. One of the funniest stories from our first trip to Antarctica, <clears throat> Seth Resnick and John Paul Caponegro. <clears throat> Seth and I were roommates, and John Paul and Stephen Johnson were roommates. But Seth was running around with a 3028 almost all the time. He almost never shot wide angle. And uh, JP was running around with his 14 millimeter. And it was interesting. We got together after an Epson Pert Academy um, and JP and Seth were showing uh, prints and photos from each other. And, and Seth and JP both identified the exact same iceberg that Seth shot with a 300, that JP shot with a 14 millimeter and they were enthralled with each other's images. And the interesting thing is on the next trip, JP went down with a 100 to 400 and um, uh, Seth had his uh, 14 to 24 zoom lens. And it was funny because they basically changed their way of looking. And that's one of the things that I'd say about Antarctica. Um, Stephen is right, you know, at a certain point, you get tired of fucking icebergs. We go out there and look and, oh, it's just another iceberg. But you can always look at it in a different way, zoom in and pay attention to detail. The other thing that I have, I've got three trips to Antarctica uh, that I want to go back and uh, look at because I want to see Antarctica in black and white. Uh, just the tonalities of ice and rock and sky and clouds I've done a couple of conversions and it's like, ooh, this is really nice because I get kind of tired of so much fucking blue. So that's <laughs> the other thing is uh, uh, consider black and white. That's one thing, John, you don't do much in the way of software uh, tutorials. I, I know a little something about software tutorials, but, and you don't really show much in the way of black and white. Uh, well, I will mention that very early on, when my teaching, I decided I'm not going to go the route of the software. I, uh, it's just not my thing. Um, if, if I could live a life as a photographer without a computer, I would probably be very happy with that. Um, I love the camera and the camera technology as far as the computer. It's not my first love, so don't follow that in that regard. Um, but black and white, I do like. I do have classes planned for black and white. Um, it's something that I commonly switch in my camera. To, and that's one of the things I love about mirrorless cameras is putting them into black and white, still shooting raw so that I can see the world in black and white. And I've already started working on material for black and white. That's how I got started. Um, and so, no, you'll see more of that in the future. Yeah, so cool. Steve is saying he appreciates the advice. Um, he's bringing an array of bodies and lenses and cards and batteries, but specifically the 70 to 200 and a 2X, and Stephen was saying not to go beyond the 1.4X. So I assume that's uh, your DSLR because Canon's new mirrorless 2X converters don't work with their 70 to 200. Really? Really. <laughs> do, do they know that? <laughs> yes. Oh. Because uh, you know the Canon extenders have that, uh, the front extends out. 
And on the RF lenses, the rear element is right at the back of the lens. So you can't mount the lens onto the, you know, the, the 2X or the 1.4X. It only works yeah, right now. Yeah, I think that was the compromise when they made the really short 70 to 200s is mm -hmm. that that's the area that got cut. I wonder yeah, if anybody- so How do you feel about teleconverters, John? I do own the, the 1X and the 2X. And mm -hmm. what was true 30 years ago is true today. Uh, it's better not to use a teleconverter. The 1.4 is not too bad. Try not to use the 2X unless you're really desperate. Um, and so you know, if, you, if you've got a small little bird and you need to get in close to it, you have the option of either cropping or using a teleconverter. Uh, the tests that I've done show that the teleconverter is better than cropping, uh, but that's none of them are as good as getting closer to that little bird. Mm -hmm. so I wonder Steve, if what any of the manufacturers have any plans of coming back with um, reflex lenses like the five hundred, the Nikon five hundred millimeter mirror lenses? Yeah, there is a patent out by I think it was Canon for that. Yeah. Okay, can I tell you my dream lens that yeah, nobody sure. made? At least I have a lot of different focal lengths, but I would like a 100 to 300 F4 with a built-in 1.4 converter. I like the 100 to 400, but I like having a steady aperture over the whole range. And that way I could have a 100 to 300 that's nice constant F4 or roughly a 100, yeah, it'd be about 125 to 420, 5.6 five, constant. Five, six. Yeah. The longest lens I brought on the Antarctica trip was the Hasselblad 500 when I took the phase one back down with it. Wow. And that, that particular lens has pretty severe chromatic aberration, but thanks to camera raw, I was able to dial that out and was quite surprised at being able to hand hold a medium format camera with the 500 millimeter lens and being able to get some photographs that were relatively sharp. I didn't have much optimism for it at the time, but it worked out pretty well. If I recall, the Hasselblad 500 was about that long, maybe a 95 millimeter filter or so. You sort of cup it around your arm <laughs> in some strange ways. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about Antarctica is being true to the craft, we all dragged our fucking tripods down there. And after the first couple of uh, shore landings, um, the number of people carrying tripods dropped precipitously. Uh, it, it was a situation where, you know, just run up the ISO if you need the shutter speed. Um, so there were reasons, you know, Stephen, when he was shooting his uh, um, um, panning camera, um, obviously that you couldn't handhold that. Although, did you ever try handholding that, Stephen? No, you can't really handhold. <laughs> well, it could be an interesting kind of, uh, uh, but anyway, um, don't fall in love with carrying a tripod around in Antarctica. It's it's tough to use on the boat, and it's. Uh, I'm not saying don't bring it because there may be situations where you want um, a long exposure, and the best way to do that is to stick it up on a tripod with a ND filter or something. But um, um, don't think that you've got to carry the damn tripod uh, every time you do a shore landing. I still was grateful to have my tripod along, even when I wasn't using the uh, scanning back on the 4x5. Didn't mean I always used it, but I was grateful to have it along. And I did use it quite a bit. So, okay, so John, my, other advice for Antarctica, tripods. my other advice for Antarctica is I think the zoom lenses are going to be a bigger benefit than the prime lenses. And it partly has to do with your limited time, either in any one time and place, switching lenses and the exposure to the elements and you're not dealing with low light conditions. And yeah, a, a prime lens might be good if you're trying to get shallow depth of field, but that's generally not a huge thing in that type of environment. I think if you want to do well, go to a desert and practice shooting in the desert, which is already a great place to shoot, but that's gonna give you the style of some of that Antarctica shooting. Well, it's also true that you spend a fair amount of time in the Zodiacs just going to and from both land and exploring icebergs. and that's not a place I'm comfortable changing lenses unless I really have to. So I really want to have a lens on that I'm going to keep on. Mm -hmm. That's also on? one That's really a zoom is what yeah. I'm implying. Go ahead, Michelle. So with, with the two bodies, um, I know a lot of people take two bodies as a backup um, or as a fail safe. 
but it's also really good that if you have two bodies with two different lenses on, take both of them out with you and then you don't have to change lenses um, when you're out in those conditions. Mm -hmm. I haven't been to Antarctica, I'll say that, but um, I have lived for a long time in the snowy mountains in Australia, which is very wet snow conditions. And I would assume that, you know, a lot of the elements um, would be the same. You don't want to change lenses. Um, the downside is then you've got two cameras to protect against the weather. And sometimes that protecting true. that camera becomes a real priority. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that is true. So Steve is asking your thought on color on um, circular polarizer filters for, for the trip or just in general. Yeah, I don't use polarizers, so. I don't leave home without one. <laughs> <laughs> I like what I see. Let's see. Kevin's asking, maybe oh. you have a tip for me. When I shoot in the city with the XT4, 70 to 300 on 300 to a range of 1.3 miles, the lines from buildings are frayed and wavy. Uh, dust pollution in the air or something like that, or is it heat waves? Is there something to avoid that? Does that make sense to you? Heat. Yeah. That sounds like atmospheric condition. That's that's the air, that's dust, that's everything between you and that building. It, it sounds like he's talking about a mile. Yeah, there's there's yeah. a lot of stuff in the air. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. No, I, I've run in similar morning. situations trying to fire the photograph SpaceX rockets down here in Texas, and they don't let you get close to those <laughs> for obvious reasons. But um, if it's a hot, if it's a hot day, 80s or above, uh, atmosphere can be a problem. So John, do you ever use monopods? Uh, that's what I was about to want to bring up in topic is I do shoot with a monopod uh, often when I'm chasing birds and I'm long. Um, I prefer a monopod and was curious. I know when you get into environments and you need some mobility, but you want the stability, particularly when you're long. Um, thoughts and comments from those with a whole lot more experience than I do uh, with regard to monopods. Yeah, the monopod, the, the purpose of a monopod in my mind is to support heavy equipment. Not perfectly still, but just take the weight off of your shoulders and your arms so that you can more easily hold the camera. Uh, most of the time people are shooting with monopods are usually, you know, two, three, four, five, six hundred millimeter lenses. They have more than enough shutter speed you know, to compensate for slight camera movements. It's just having that camera in the ready position for that long period of time. So obviously, you know, on the Antarctica trip, going back to that, using the tripod off of the boat isn't going to work out too well. But I did have a monopod that I would use with my 302A just so that I could have it ready for when the whales were going to breach out of the water. And so I, you know, I, I could just leave it there and I could rest and scratch my head and then, okay, boom, the camera's in perfect ready position for shooting. And so it's a very valuable tool, but I think it, it's really only helpful when you want to have that camera in the ready position without you actually holding it there. Uh, the other thing I'll say is I've recently developed um, kind of some difficulty walking on uneven ground and um, um, I've got, I actually got a, uh, a monopod uh, with a really right uh, stuff head, but I've been using it as a walking staff so that uh, I, it's easier for me to walk on uneven ground because I don't want to fall. And so as opposed to a tripod where you've got to do the extensions, and it was funny when we were in Antarctica, uh, Bill Atkinson, and if you don't know Bill, Bill is employee number 41 at Apple. Absolutely brilliant guy, but just really kind of dogmatic. And uh, he thought that anybody that had a tripod with a center column was just uh, ludicrous because he refused to use center column because it ruins the stability of the tripod. So he's out there <laughs> fucking around. He's got a medium format camera fucking around with the lens or the legs trying to get the right height and other people around him are taking their camera up and down on the center column. And, and I don't know, Steve, do you, do you remember if Bill ever kind of admitted that a center column can be useful? You're muted, Steve. I don't recall. Yeah. Uh, but that's certainly the term dogmatic and great human being at the same time can apply to Bill simultaneously. 
So, John, talking about long lenses, you had any thoughts on the 600 and 800 Canon, um, their fixed F11 trombone style lenses? I haven't put my hand on them, but I applaud Canon for letting people who don't have an immense budget get into the world of telephoto photography. And, you know, for people wanting to shoot lunar stuff and, you know, sunsets, you know, with the sun, you know, behind the buildings and what have you, uh, beginner wildlife lens, that's, that's great to see. Uh, I'd personally be a little bit more interested in maybe something a little shorter, a little bit faster. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think they would be wise to come out with a 500, 5, 6. Um, you know, their 400, 5, 6, they had originally, they never came out with their IS version of that. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad that they're doing some interesting lenses along with the, the staples that we all need in the 70 to 200, two eights and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, re, I remember having, from the outside, I remember I, having a 500 a millimeter, a 500 millimeter F5.0 Nikkor reflector lens. Wow. So I, I have both the Canon 600 and the 800 F11s. And um, they're clearly not as sharp as the um, the EF lenses, you know, the um, the twelve thirteen thousand dollar lenses. But I think they're they're more for just than just their price making them more accessible. The weight difference is enormous. The fact that I can hand hold a, a six hundred or an eight hundred millimeter lens without too much effort and carry it around without a lot of uh, weight consequence is uh, really an enormous step forward. And so I've found, especially for things that are nearby, that you just want that magnification on to simplify and get close, the lenses are really quite good. They're, they're not as sharp. And consequently, as you're dealing with subject matters that are further away, you've got more atmospheric interference. It, <clears throat> they don't hold up as well in that circumstance. But, I've been quite impressed with what they can do. And yeah, then the price does become part of the, uh, the can do means you can have them. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting both and I didn't think I would uh, initially, uh, but the 600 proved uh, so effective in certain situations that I went and borrowed the 800 and then decided to buy it as well. Thanks. John, can you, can you comment on, uh, on staying with long lenses here as far as some of the bodies True in Sony, um, but also possibly in Canon, because I'm not familiar with the newer Canon R5, R6. Uh, going from uh, full frame to crop mode as a way of really kind of cropping in camera and getting a little closer to your subject. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I've seen some other photographers talk a lot about that. I have never used that technique. And I guess I would be more inclined to do it with the higher resolution bodies. So if you have an A7R4 at 60 megapixels, um, yeah, you know, a, a 30 megapixel image of a bird is probably going to be just fine for most all of our uses on it. Um, and, you know, I, I am all for trying to get as good a view of what your final image is going to be. And so if you know you have to crop in and you know you're going to crop that away and you have a shortcut button on your camera, to immediately pop in. It makes perfect sense if you're just going to be cropping everything away anyway. Um, but then it makes me think, well, maybe I want to use it and have a little bit more creative composition later on that I wasn't considering at the time I was shooting. Um, and so I guess I can see both points of either side. I don't, I don't use that technique that much, but I am more than happy using a crop frame body. I have a 90D that's going to be my wildlife and telephoto camera for many things. I work, I work in a similar manner, cropping with the hot button off an A7R3, and it's great. I, I, it, to me, it, and the, the other advantage by cropping in in camera is instead of coming home with a thousand forty forty plus megapixel files, you come home with a thousand twenty megapixel files, and they're all very usable. That's a good point. John, have you done any comparison on Canon's compressed RAW versus regular RAW? Yeah, I've done extensive testing, and I would love to hear feedback from anyone else who's found something that I have. So I've shot the compressed RAW versus standard RAW. 
I can see a difference in the files, but I can't say that one's better. So then I proceeded to shoot them underexposed and overexposed by one, two, three, four, five stops. And I can't see a quality difference that makes one better than the other. Now, there may be an impact if you shoot ISO 6400 and your four stops underexposed that one is a little bit better than the other. But please, ISO 6400 and four stops underexposed, um, you're in a bad situation right then. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I, mean, I, I shoot them too. I, yeah, I them compared them a bit too, and I haven't seen any difference. Like, you know, I'll take the same shot and put them overlaid in Photoshop in difference mode too, and really can't see anything changing in them. Yeah, I'm happy to see the like detail rock. is still there. Yeah, and it saves a lot of space. Yeah, absolutely. What about the right times to the card? Um, the right times to the card I haven't seen as being an issue, but you do bring up the fact that there is some software issues that have a more difficult time with the compressed raw than the full raw. And that's something that you should do a little test out if you're using a tablet or PC or Mac and whatever programs you're using to see how that works with what you're doing. I, I'm pretty simple. I use Apple, I use Lightroom and it works fine. The only caution I would put in there is I'm, I'm uneasy about the proprietary raw file formats anyway because of company ownership. And that's why I was enthusiastic about DNG until Adobe started requiring a credit card for everything. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, I'm a little uneasy about yet another level of um, complexity to the raw data that the compression entails. So I can't say I've tried it much, but uh, that's my hesitation for whatever that's worth. Well, I'd like other people in the audience that haven't spoken up that may have some questions for John. Is there anyone else out there that has something they want to ask? Feel free to unmute and say hi to us. So John, I've got, I've got two. Um, yeah, one, yeah. Is, one, one is I don't, I don't really believe there's a, unless you know that there's a great wide angle lens out there that doesn't have a substantial amount of distortion. And I'd be, I'd be interested in your, and remember I'm a Nikon shooter, I'd be interested in your opinion. And then I think that the discussion about the long lens is fascinating, but it appears to me it's trade-offs. So yeah, I could get a better picture probably with a long fixed uh, focal length lens but I'm also gonna miss some pictures because it's a fixed focal length lens and it's probably heavier. And I, I love my 70 to 200. That's why I put the picture behind me. That's the uh, uh, South Rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, but I have a 150 to 600 Tamron G2. And I, Mike Jackson, who you may know from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, he just switched to the 60 to 600 Sigma. And he loves it because you get so much more opportunity than if you just had that fixed focal length lens and it weighs less. And uh, so I got rid of all my fixed focal length lenses. And uh, I'd be interested in what you think about that. And then before we get off here, I want you to talk about where you're going to plan your next workshop trip to because you had one to Bhutan. I didn't get to go. I, I'd love to do something like that. I've never been to Antarctica for the rest of you, and that's on the bucket list. I'd love to do that. So I'd like for you to talk about that. Okay, let's see. Uh, going back to question <laughs> number one on the wide angle lenses. Yeah, most of them do have uh, a fair bit of distortion. You know, I notice that when I go into Lightroom and I, you know, click on the auto correct or uh, whatever that button is. And I think you're going to see that more in the zooms than in the primes. And it it just exists. Uh, it is easily correctable, so I'm not too concerned about it. Um, the other thing is, is that it's it's not something that's readily noticeable unless you're doing an A-B comparison. You shoot a wide angle shot, you show it to somebody, they're generally just going to accept it. And uh, now if you show them the B shot where it's corrected, they're like, oh, wow, okay, now I can see it. Um, so it's, it's an important issue. I'd like to see lenses that are better corrected on it. Um, but there's, I think there's worse things to be worried about. 
Um, yeah, when it comes to wide the, angle and distortion, I mean, there's two things we're looking at. Uh, the term distortion usually refers to barrel or pin cushion, the edges pulling in or out. But then people talk about distortion, like a, if you shoot a group of people and the people on the ends are stretched out. And that's not a lens problem. That's being too close to them. I mean, that's yeah, just a I, geometric thing. Yeah, I think we need to improve the uh, terminologies that we use in photography because distortion kind of my first thought is, is OK, the earth is, you know, rather than the horizon being one way or the other, it's bending one way. And then there is, I don't know, some people call it spatial distortion, where when you're off to the corner, your mm -hmm. head becomes a little bit more oval and so forth. And that's just natural of a wide angle. That's just more an attribute of your point of view and your angle of view. That's going to happen with any lens. But I was referring to actual distortion where straight lines are bent. Right. In that case. right. And I will tell you what my biggest grief is, is uh, wide angle panels. Mm. Um, now step back and use a long lens and do a many, many shots to make your panel. Yeah. Or you can use the tilt chip lens. Yeah, okay. um, and then there was a topic of uh, telephotos. I don't know that I was ever promoting prime telephotos. I, I mean, I do have a 300 28. It's one of my favorite lenses. Uh, but I think the 100 to 400 and the 70 to 200 are just some of the most practical lenses a photographer can get. And the, the subtle and slight image quality differences between the zooms and primes is so small. Um, doesn't bother me at all. And then as far as tours, um, I'm, I'm not going to be the first one out of the gate when it comes to tours and COVID and so forth. I, I want to make sure that my travelers are safe and that they have 100% trust in me and the rest of the trip. Uh, I did send out a questionnaire to some of my subscribers as to what do they want. And, you know, some people came back and they said, I don't want to be forced to be vaccinated. And then other people said, well, I don't want unvaccinated people trip on my trip, um, limiting us in where we can go and what we can do. And so I want to make sure that the locations that we go to are safe and something that we feel comfortable. I don't have a specific number or stat that I can put to that right now, but it's something that um, I want to feel comfortable with first. And in fact, I may go out and do some test trips to make sure everything is the way it should be beforehand, which means I should get out traveling pretty soon. <laughs> and I John agree Hess with is the asking in the chat there, he has a Fuji X-T4 and he's a cyclist. So that's up your alley. What are your lens recommendations for bike packing with this camera? Um, I'm kind of a big fan of Fuji's new 16 to 80. It's roughly a 24 to 120 range. And so I could live very happily all the time with that lens. Now, I, the problem I have is that I still like that 18 to 55. That is just so small, best kit lens ever in photography. Uh, it depends a little bit on what environment you're in and how you're carrying it. Is it on you? Is it in a padded bag on the back rack or something? Uh, but I think in situations like I've done a lot of bike tours and climbing trips, you just have to put some limitations on what you're going to focus on and what you're going to try to document. And narrowing it down to one zoom lens certainly simplifies it. John, could I come for a second? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to really agree with the uh, COVID virus hesitancy about running workshops. I, I have to be out there for myself and moving around and being sure I'm comfortable before I wanna ask people to gather. The first ones I'm gonna try are completely outdoor workshops and that's not till December. And um, you know, all prep, all pre-meetings done virtually. Um, the other thing that I wanted to come back to is uh, somebody said earlier that the tele extender can't be used with the uh, Canon 70 to 200 on the new cameras. Yes, if I understood correctly. It, it certainly does. Uh, you, if you use a uh, an EF tele extender in front of the the uh, EF to RF converter, it works just fine, like any other uh, EF lens being put onto the RF lens system. So. Something, something ah, checked it out. Very because, tricky. He added an element that we weren't talking yes. about. Well, it's the only way to use the 7200 unless you're going to buy a brand new RF. Yeah. Well, I, I do have a 70 to 200 RF lens. Yeah. And that one has the flat, has the, the rear elements right at the back. Well, you'd be using the new uh, RF tele extender then, wouldn't you? The RF tele extenders have, do not fit on it. 
that's interesting that they would design a system that doesn't work now when I've got my old system that works just fine. Yeah, it worked on the, the old ones. The, the teleconverter right now only works with the 600 and the 800. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well. They're physically incompatible. Holy it works shit, with the, it works with the 100. mistake. It works with the 100 to 500 zoom, but not over the whole range. Sony has a similar thing. And I think what's going on is they don't feel they can correct things enough. Anyway. So for whatever uh, that's worth, I, I just wanted to make sure. I, cause yes, I, thank you. Do you have a class for the Z50 Nikon? No, that's um, that's kind of fallen in the creative live to John Gringo gap of cameras that I just haven't been able to get my get time to do. I've been too busy building out the studio and stuff. Um, it's unknown. It's there's a production limitation of how fast I can make classes. <laughs> uh, if I had infinite time, yeah, it'd be on the list right now. It's not near the top of the list, but I am thinking very strongly about the ZFC, which will have a lot of similar uh, internal components and menu settings. Cool. Have you thought of any weekend local US workshops uh, if you're doing your beta test of tours? Uh, Thomas is saying you just did one with Art Wolf and worked well in Oregon with a small team. Yeah, I would like to do something. Uh, my current name is the Seattle Travel Photography Workshop. They get people who haven't been to Seattle to come out get to see the city and learn photography at the same time. Um, but I've just been so concentrated on getting what I have up and running. And now that it's up and it's smooth, uh, my wife and I have been looking at the next year and a half uh, as far as the schedule of new classes and allowing time to develop all these other products. Uh, so in some ways, uh, as we come out of this whole COVID pandemic, I'm restarting everything again. So I'm, I'm starting from scratch and gonna build a whole new career here. Cool. So give me time. Can I, <laughs> can I also add to that? Um, we get a lot of our suggestions from, um, you know, the subscribers from the newsletter and everything that, that John has, and we really love feedback. So if there's somewhere that people want to go, let us know. Um, if there's a camera class that you particularly want, let us know. And um, we always listen to what people want before we decide what we're going to do. I'm going to go, go back a bit. I've finished in the now. Chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Earlier, Jim was asking a question about, have you seen changes in the people who buy your classes? You know, he's been on the periphery of diverse photo communities and been seeing changes. Uh, a lot of photographers in response to what other photographers do. So if you see the communities changing. Hmm. Unfortunately, I, because so many of my classes are online, I don't get to meet them. <laughs> um, and so I, I still, well, up until COVID, I was teaching classes and I will continue to teach classes in person here in Seattle, as well as doing workshops and tours. Um, no, no, I, I, I haven't seen it. Um, Maybe maybe one tr trend I'm noticing is that, and maybe it's more the way that I am projecting myself and people who come back to me is, uh, these are people who are passionate about photography, but they have no desire to quit their job and try to become a professional photographer. These are people who just enjoy the craft of photography and like me, just enjoy it as the added way to enjoy life. And so I, I think I've gotten a fair number of people who are just happy in the fact that, no, I'm not trying to make this a business. I just want to create some artwork and maybe put it on the wall behind me here. And so uh, I very much enjoy working with that type of, of person. It's, I wouldn't know what to do with the person who says, I need to become a professional photographer and I want you to tell me how to do it because I don't have the answer for that person. Do you find any feedback and, and blowback on, on pricing? Um, practically zero. Um, I, I know that there's people out there that are of the mindset, well, I can get anything for free on YouTube. And yeah, if YouTube is free. No, I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not even going to that extreme. I'm talking about if something was like $400 uh, two years ago, uh, uh, because of COVID and what's going on with the economy, why isn't it $250 this year? Uh, yeah, well, at least as far as my classes, which I've recently launched, we haven't got one single direct criticism of the price at all. I think if you put a reasonable value on it and it's a good product for that price, 
um, then generally people are going to be happy with it. But no, I, I think people have been fine with that. I've had a lot of people who say they'd spend a lot more money, but um, that's great to hear. Elizabeth's asking if you've done anything on the Sony A1, or if not, if there's something that comes close to the A1. Ah, see, A1, it's a tough one. That camera has a ton of technology. I would love to sink my teeth into it. Um, I've got this backlog of cameras, and I know that there's a limited market with the A1 um, because of the price of it. I, personally, I think Sony went a little over the top on the price. Um, and so I... I would like to get to it. We'll see if time time makes it. I think it it looks like a great camera, um, and I, you know I like where Sony's going. I'd like to see a little bit beefier style, but that's more on the style of camera, not the instruction of it. Have Sony menus improved over time? You know what? I really don't want to be this guy, but do I need to defend the Sony menu system? <laughs> the fact know. that <laughs> you know what, Canon's got some quirky things too. What? They've got some weird things. So does Nikon. I can make complaints about everyone. If you could put me in a locked room with the people who design these menu systems, they would get an earful. You know, <laughs> try to decide what you're going to capitalize. Where are you going to put your freaking menu system for movies versus stills? And why does Canon hide so many things in their menu system? As I say, I don't want to defend Sony, but yeah. there's a lot of other guilty parties out there. Interesting. Anyone else? No comment from Newler about <laughs> Canon's menus? No, because I think that the entire industry as we knew it is going down the toilet anyway. It really is. They haven't, they haven't, they haven't figured out since, uh, since Apple came out with the iPhone, why are they losing market share? They haven't, they haven't figured that out yet. You know, and, and, and once they do, um, it will be, it'll be too late because uh, every year uh, in, in the near future, um, the traditional camera manufacturers and lens manufacturers, as we, as we, as we all grew up knowing them, uh, are going to be losing more and more market share. The buying public just does not want the type of equipment that they're manufacturing, period. I mean, uh, and if somebody wants proof, uh, take a look at how many camera manufacturers and lens manufacturers have have fallen fallen by the wayside and and, and and are no more. You know, when I started in this in this in this business, there were like seven or eight uh, medium format cameras. How many are there today? Michael, that that's not Three? a good argument. Look look at the the PC industry and how many computer companies no longer exist but i don't see the computer business going out of business it no, just but windows you're, down no, but to you, the strong characters but you, but you're comparing apples to oranges we're talking about a a phone that also does photographs what does a camera do does it call home no it's it's the same thing that was 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 manufactured by Leica back in the in the twenties, there's been no. This sounds like the argument of 150 years ago, when when artists were saying, well, "What's going to happen to painting? It's going to disappear because cameras have come out." Well, you're right. I don't see painting disappear. Well, because painters painters aren't photographers, and photographers aren't painters. <laughs> In and, a most gonna, sense. and most people. I'm going to take this in a totally new direction, though. I'm going to ask Harris to ask a question here. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Antarctica, we've been talking about equipment, but he has a really great question about as humans feel when they approach Antarctica. So go ahead, Harris. Hi, guys. Nice to see everybody. I've really enjoyed this. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm curious about for each of the people who've been to the Antarctic and other kind of extreme environments like that. What was it like for you as a human just to suddenly or maybe not so suddenly, maybe it's gradual, but what was it like to, to encounter this, this world? And did you grow tired of it at any time? Was it a, a kind of a spiritual experience? Were you in awe of it? Did you kind of, were you just gobsmacked? Um, well, I've not been to, I've been to Alaska and I've been to other places, but I've never been to the Antarctic. So um, I'll tell you, to be honest, it, uh, our first trip, 
Um, and Stephen, will, I think, will back me up. I on think this. Joanna wants to add something too. Let me give her, please unmute Joanna, and I'll get back to you, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have, have not been to Antarctica, but I have been to Svalbard, actually a lot closer to the North Pole than you get to the South Pole at the, uh, in Antarctica, plus very few people up there. I was out for about a week on a very small boat, um, and we saw one other vessel, one. So the immersion in the experience was profound, and uh, it's it is completely otherworldly. It's something you read about in all the discussions of climate change, but then when you see it in front of your very face, it's a very, for me at least, it was a very emotional and exciting and profound experience, but also a lot of fun, interesting, and from a photo photographer's point of view, fabulous, just fabulous. There was something to see at all sides at every moment of the day or night for that matter. I mean, we were, there was, there's no limitation in the summertime when you can be out there taking your pictures or doing whatever, uh, or just gazing around or just enjoying mm -hmm. the visuals or seeing the birds or whatever you're doing. So, Can you mention uh, where that was again, Joanna? Well, this was in Svalbard. You go to okay. the top of Norway and then just head up north. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, the I went with a small group of twelve people and a very small boat, and we went out in zodiacs, kind of like you do in, in Antarctica, also. But you never see anybody else; just your own little party. So it has this encapsulated feeling, and I I, I think it was simply unbelievable thank you jeff you were sorry to interrupt you i wanted to get joanna in there no that's fine uh, harris in answer to your question it was absolutely exhausting both physically mentally and emotionally and it was kind of the ultimate photographic experience because we were on a boat this was with michael reichman and it was, uh, Michael filled the boat with photographers, which was uh, rare or unusual or had not been done. So everything about the whole trip was organized around photography. And uh, Seth termed, came up with the term major gigage. We just shot until I literally remember my hand tramping because I was photographing so much. Everywhere I turned, there was something to shoot. And it's funny because you can't think. You really just go on gut reaction and physical, um, you know, uh, there's something to shoot, so you, you shoot it. And then the other thing is we were under the influences of scopolamine. <laughs> um, we had anti-seasick patches, which had two things. One was it tended to give us really dry mouth and of course it's dry in antarctica so we actually ended up drinking a lot of wine to counteract the dry mouth <laughs> so, <laughs> no seriously seth and i yeah and right like that one of the a whole shitload of wine <laughs> and, uh, not work. <laughs> uh i gotta tell you i mean it worked but uh the other thing is sleep was optional uh literally the bunks um uh, Seth and I had a, uh, our bunks were at perpendicular and I was going this way with the rock. Seth was going this way. He couldn't sleep because the way the uh, boat was rocking, he kept rolling over and a couple of times fell out of bed. So when it was rough, uh, just a real tough physical environment also um, getting um on land and, and walking with those big goofy boots that they made us wear. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, particularly our ship was not in the least bit luxurious. Um, uh, so it was a converted Russian research vessel. And, uh, but I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. So tell me, tell, uh, tell me something, Jeff. Um, this experience that you, you just described was the first time that you went there. Now you've been back about two or three more times, right? I've been there three times. Seth has been there like 20 times. Right. 
but is it can you describe the other two times that you went there against the first as being as exciting as it was the first time uh the second trip was the longest and probably the least fun uh we started and and went to um uh, the Falklands and then went down to the peninsula. Um, it was very challenging because of weather. Like I said, we lost a bunch of cameras and lenses. Um, and, and it was, it was like 21 days. It was just too fucking long. Um, the third one, and also three different times of the season. Our first one was in December. Our second one was in January, February. And the third one was at the end of February. And we saw a lot more uh, um, uh, wildlife um, on the, uh, was it the second one, Steve? Um, Seems like it. I think that's when we saw the whale breach and right in yeah. front of it. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it was just, um, uh, the other thing that was really 2005 to 2009, not a long time, but Nico Harbor, Nico, N-I-K-K-O Harbor, we went to the same place on all three trips. And what was shocking and amazing was how far the glacier had gone back. When we first went, it was out into the water. And on our last trip, there was about 150 feet of shore. And the people on the expedition were like shocked at how far the, the glacier had retreated. And so uh, Antarctica is really suffering. So is the Arctic. Uh, all of the, um, well, the whole earth is suffering from massive uh, climate change. So that was, that's, that's all I got. Well, the other part that of that helped Harris. I, I, I've got some comments for Harris too on his question, if we've got a moment. I seriously believe that nobody is going to Antarctica for at least another year, because in South America, there are countries in South America that you need to go to before you head on to uh, Antarctica that will not, that are suffering because of COVID, the, the, the new strain of COVID. So Thanks, that's going to be a, a, quite a while. Yeah, well, that, that could well be, Michael. The, uh, I think the thing that was uh, most profound for me about the Antarctica trip, and that remained true of all four of the trips I've done down there, is that it, it's something I mentioned earlier. It's, it's almost as though you're, you're getting near the edge of another world. And I don't mean another environment on earth. I mean something that gives you a feeling as though you're, you're on the verge of being on an ice planet and um, ice and sea planet. <clears throat> when you are work, walking on dirt, it actually starts to feel unusual that there is dirt there as well. And the fact that there are no trees anywhere and the plant life is pretty minimal in that dirt, you start to get a feeling of what it might be like to stroll another planet. And then you think back, at least I thought back to the fact that Antarctica was once in a different position on the planet, had tropical forests and was, there's a whole history of the planet Earth buried underneath that ice. And it made me keep thinking about the cycles the Earth has gone through in terms of its, its own evolution, climate changes, species changes, perhaps civilizations rising up and falling away to the point that we don't even know uh, what was before us. It, it gets you a lot of, uh, thought into your place on the planet, not just the cost of going down, I don't mean economic cost, I mean environmental cost, because it's a heavy cost you're putting on the planet to go down there. And uh, that sense of where we're at as photographers, what we intend to do with our work, how we can try and make a difference for places, and uh, the economic impact, uh, uh, impact of our travel. It provoked a lot of thought, a lot of introspection, a lot of trying to understand the planet for the breadth of what it is, rather than these very narrow views that we carry around most of the time. So I found every one of the four trips I've been down to be profoundly emotional and intellectually stimulating and very humbling uh, in Thank all you. of those ways together. Cool, and change again a little bit. I wanna follow up from Elizabeth on the Sony cameras, the AR-74 or the A9? 
Um, very different purposes for those cameras. Uh, uh, as someone who shoots a little bit more in the landscape world, I like the A7R4. That, that resolution is fantastic. A9, very fast shooting, good for photojournalists and sports photography. And so uh, that's one of the things that we deal with in this world is cameras designed for slightly different types of photographers. And we got to find one that fits pretty close to us. So, John, what's your favorite place to travel? Uh, someplace new. <laughs> uh i so so here's an absolute true story i was um unemployed and i had a lot of free time so i decided to go on the computer list all the countries of the world and give it a one to ten rating on how much i want to travel to that country one of the countries that got a one star one point rating was the country of jordan small country middle of the desert i not really much going on uh, a few years later, I'm working for Art Wolf. He had a tour to Jordan that didn't work out for him. And so he kind of hand, handed me down the journey and says, well, John, you can lead it. And it'll be at a different price point. And here's some people who want to go and teach him photography and go to Jordan. I'm like, well, OK, I'll go to Jordan. I'll go any place new. And it was awesome. It was totally wonderful. I just did not know enough about Jordan and what it had. And when you get boots on the ground, everything changes. And so I, I have the most hopeful, optimistic attitude about every location in the world. You could tell me a country that's supposed to be horrible, terrible, there's nothing good is going on there. And unless it's war-torn, that's kind of a special exception. I'm pretty much willing to go there and see it firsthand because I have gotten such horrible advice from non-photographers about what is good and what is bad. Uh, we all have our own idea of what we like and what we enjoy. And as photographers, we can really interpret things however we want. And I think with a positive attitude, you can find a lot of things really wonderful. Uh, having said that, there are some places that are just intrinsically more interesting intellectually or photographically, and I understand that. But um, I think you can make any place turn really good. Cool. Stephen Shore, I want to acknowledge that you wrote into the chat a lot about round and square sensors and the like. I don't know if we'll get into it all here right now, but if people want to look in the chat or you can save the chat and go back through it and read about that. Is there anything summarized you want to say, Stephen? Sure. Oh, just that uh, I haven't seen a lot of, of round pictures on walls and most of what we do is rectangular for lots of economic reasons. And it's the same kind of things with sensors. Um, I can see reasons why photographers might want a round sensor, but economically, it's just going to make larger, heavier cameras that aren't going to, in the end, really give us much. What about a square sensor? Just larger, uh, 36 same, by 36. Yeah, you have the same problem, whether it's round or square, it's going to take up the same amount of space, both in camera mm -hmm. and on the, the silicon slice that's being manufactured by. And it's going to be much more expensive the camera is going to have to be more expensive. The viewfinder is going to have to be more expensive. Uh, the camera will probably weigh 25% more than the cameras do now. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to walk around with a four pound camera instead of a three pound camera for eight hours. Stephen, how about a 24 by 24 uh, 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 sensor? Well, <laughs> again, um, if, you're, if you're making a size that people don't make prints of, it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, I think we were talking about being able to pick landscape or vertical uh, afterwards. Yeah, my original idea was a round sensor that I suppose you could shoot round, but I wouldn't expect most people to do that, but that you would have a round that you would take your three by two horizontal or a four by five vertical or a 16 by nine wide just by pressing a button on the camera. And I'm, and I'm not thinking of it from the manufacturer's term because I understand making the chips would be one of the big challenges of that. I'm just thinking about the end up photographer's experience when they're out shooting. Wouldn't it be a lot better just to press a button to switch through your favorite different formats than having to turn the camera or crop edges off? Well, the, the problem is when you increase the size of the chip, you do two things. You have less chips you can make every time you do a run of, of slices. And two, because of defects in the manufacturing process, larger size chips have lower yields. 
So you're probably going to double the double the price of the chip at least, maybe more. And yes, that's not going to double the price of the camera, but it might increase the price of the camera by a third. So instead of buying a, an R5 for four thousand dollars, do you want to spend fifty five hundred dollars on it? Then you're in the price of the Sony. <laughs> and, and, and and you know how how many people are going to take advantage of that? And, and spend the extra money and get the heavier camera. I mean, I, I can see a reason for it, yes. But when you look at manufacturing and when you look at what gets hung on the wall, um, it's it's just a, a low number of people who would end up buying those cameras. Yeah, maybe right. But I do I do like the idea of more diversity. Um, I love Leica. I think they make really unusual cameras that are not right for most people, but I like the fact that they're just doing something that's completely out of sync with what comes out of Japan. And the difference between Canon and Nikon and Sony really isn't that much in my mind if you think of how different things could be. And so I am I'm all for diversity of cameras. Oh, I, I agree. I've, I've probably used a larger range of types of cameras than anybody on this this, this conference. Uh, I've, I've used 40,000 frame per second cameras and, and, and cameras that take up whole rooms. Um, and I see a reason for every one of them. But if you are a, a, a quality, quantity manufacturer like Canon or Nikon or Sony, you, you don't make a lot of, of special interest cameras where you only be able to sell 100 of them. You want to sell 100,000 of each one. So my pain point is when you go vertical and it's a low point of view and, you know, you have the articulating screen and I can't figure out why they don't make our, every articulating screen so that it turns so that you can stand up and see what you're doing as opposed to laying on the ground sideways and hoping that you are level and, and get it the way it should be. Well, I, I think it depends on the articulating screen because some of them just fold out in one direction and some like the, well, I'm, I'm shooting my video right now on a, um, a 60D, a Canon 60D, and it, it turns around in any direction I want to hold it in. Yeah, John's got the R5 there. Yeah, like that, exactly. Yeah. What, what John so, is showing right now. Yeah, so uh, there's a love-hate I have with this little piece of technology and for shooting your low angle shots, yeah, you can get it like this. You can get it right next to the ground. You can see vertically straight down on there. But I'm a guy who also likes to use an L plate. And that means every time I open this up, it goes right into the L plate and stops. In which case I actually prefer something like the Sony, which just has a flip out screen, but then I can't shoot the verticals. So Fuji had it the best addressed for a while, but I think there's a better technology where I don't know, the hinge manufacturer, this is pretty simple and pretty effective, uh, but I think there is a way to avoid this hitting the L bracket that I would love to see in, in my own ideal camera. Well, here I've got a, an L bracket here from um, what's a three-legged thing, and it, it seems to have a little more range of motion available for... Yeah, it depends. Know, Does it, is it the one that has the cutout? Yeah, it has a cutout in it here. Let me see. Yeah, you can, can kind of get the screen slipped in there. Yeah, uh, some of them uh, are a full plate there where it does interfere yeah. with it. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's some workarounds. Well, and then when you put the L bracket on and you want to use it and you go vertical and you want to use an intervalometer on some camera, <laughs> you can't slide it in all the way into your ball head because your intervalometer cable won't allow you to do it. I'm like, yeah, this cutout works for that cable too. But, but one of the pluses, most of the new cameras have intervalometers built into the cameras now. Yeah, nice feature that's been added. Very nice. So anyway, let's close up with Jeff Shiwi had a quote of yours, John, from your art versus tech, that the great land of photographic opportunity and potential lie more in the world of technique and composition than anywhere else. Yes, become an expert in your gear so it's not an obstacle to your more important goals. Then focus on what will truly make you a better photographer and pursue it like your craft depends on it. I think we can all agree with that. You know, it's not all about the technique that we all like to talk about the equipment sometimes. Right, thank you. Do you have any final words for us today, John? Boy, I... Uh... <laughs> Uh, no, uh, it's been great talking with all of you, hearing your questions and your thoughts. 
And I do hope to uh, lead some more tours and trips in the future. And I did have a, a revelation when I was out shooting at the University of Washington uh, cherry blossoms that were out. And I think uh, in, in my group tours, I'm really gonna focus on the work that everyone does so that they can learn from each other. I think, you know, as much as I know and as much as I've been in the industry, there's only so much I can teach people. And I'd like to gather groups of people that can help share their points of view and their ideas. And so I will be hopefully doing workshops and tours where everybody are everybody in the classroom is a teacher. Nice. Nice. Anyone else have anything last minute they want to ask or share? Otherwise, I'm going to thank you all for a great show today. Uh, let's see. Just getting some thank yous in the comments. So I'm going to stop the Facebook feed now. So just one, just one comment for John. Yeah. You, John, you, you don't know what impact you really make. I don't believe that you're, you, you have a large ripple effect and um, it, and it probably goes farther than you understand. And I, I've, I've always found that your classes are really, really, really good. And, and that's obvious. But I think the other thing is, um, and one thing that had a profound effect on me is in one of your classes, you said, you're, you said that you're only five minutes from a good photo at all times. And um, I have used that over and over and over again when people are saying, well, there's not much going on right now. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. There really is. And it's amazing. And, and what that does is it makes me self-aware to the fact that I'm taking pictures that I think are really good pictures. And you all have experienced this when other people are driving down the street past this and they never even noticed that it existed. And, and for that, I will be ever grateful for you. No, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to end the recording here.